Hello everyone, welcome to What If Issei's parents was killed by Kakabia Land becomes the Emperor's Champion Part 4. Before we start please go support Skinny40k for writing that awesome fanfic, now let's begin. The God Scheme Unfolds Part 2. 25 minutes have passed since the meeting between the Emperor, Lady Asaka, and Lady Karara began. They are finishing up discussing all the important matters regarding the Imperium of Man's plans going forward, including completing the incorporation of the Yakai faction into the Imperium. They are also talking about the upgrades to the East and West Yakai factions done by the Emperor, which will be finished soon, along with the completed installation of all their defenses and security systems that have been fully installed and are completely online. Additionally, talks about recruitment and training of military personnel from Yakai and humans from the residents of the cities to join the Imperial Navy and Imperial Army, which will be formed soon, are ongoing. Both the futures of the East and West Yakai factions look very bright, even brighter than they did before. However, that wasn't the only reason the Emperor was here, he did need to discuss those matters, but he wanted to ask a certain question regarding a promise to a very old friend and to reveal a truth to Lady Asaka and Karara. Karara. Honestly, my Emperor, after everything I've heard and we have discussed so far in this meeting, has definitely made me feel very protected as well as proud to be a member of your Imperium. Along with my people's safety in mind, I couldn't thank you enough for everything you've done for me, my daughters, and my people so far, including the upgrades to our cities. These are so advanced, not to mention the high security measures and defenses you've put into place to protect all of us. It is quite amazing how fast it was done, and to think you've actually decided to reveal the truth only to those humans within the cities. The Yakai of both the East and West no longer need to hide and can live in harmony with humans, though there are going to be a few hiccups I can imagine still. But this is definitely the right step in the right direction. Isaka. I agree with Karara on this. From everything we discussed, I'm very hopeful and couldn't be any happier with the outcomes, especially since you are willing to allow yakai that depend on humans to continue their race, as long as it's done in a controlled manner, and it's not against the will of either the yakai or humans. You're very merciful and kind, my emperor, not only thinking of the priorities of the yakai, but also of humans, and ensuring that neither can take advantage of the other. Emperor. Well, of course, it is only fair to treat any citizens of my imperium of man with the same kindness as I would treat humanity. I do realize there are yakai races that can only reproduce with humans and prefer making humans their partners considering most yakai bond with one individual in their whole lives and make them their life partner. So, as long as both of you are dedicated to regulating these kinds of relationships, ensuring they are consensual and based on love rather than mere lust or a need to procreate, and monitoring these kinds of relationships are your responsibilities, Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara, due to both of your domains having more autonomy and freedoms than most. So, as long as you make sure that children born from these unions of yakai and humans, where children are conceived out of love and not manipulated by magical or forceful means, then I will have no problem with it. I must also consider both my citizens' welfare, of the yakai and humans, along with any other races that might join in the future, and how they will interact with one another, because I am not foolish enough to believe that there would not be some bad eggs in both groups, trying to force themselves on the other, if they had the ability to do so. I will not allow the mistreatment of other races that willingly join my Imperium, regardless of them being human or not. They will not be treated any differently than any other Imperial citizen. If a race one deem worthy enough to join my growing and glorious Imperium, they should be given the rights, abilities, and chance to have a flourishing life as I would want for all my citizens, because my dream is to have a human empire that expands beyond our own planet and solar system. One in which humanity dominates the stars alongside its allies that have joined my Imperium. All who are willing to join, as long as they have shown no hostility to humanity, will be allowed into my vast Imperium, which will not be so close-minded as to refuse entry to others wishing to partake in humanity's glory. Isaka, I truly appreciate your compassion and consideration. I am impressed by the way you not only prioritize human rights, but also include those of different races who will join in the future. It truly makes me proud to be a part of your Imperium. However, I am surprised by all the weapons and technology that the dwarves of Svartifheim have made for you, not to mention the Greek god of technology and creation, Hephaestus, has also helped you with. Considering he's been teaching humans how to make advanced technologies and produce them on a massive scale, among all the other things he's been helping you with along with the dwarves. But with that said, I'm quite curious about why they haven't already defected from their current factions to join your Imperium. Is there a reason why they have not yet? Emperor. Ah, a very reasonable question, Lady Asaka. Well, the dwarves of Svartifheim are coming close to completely announcing their defection to the Norse pantheon, particularly the Asgardians, and that arrogant god who thinks he knows all, Odin, who believes he controls all nine realms and will not allow them to defect. 
Realizing they are very key to his strength due to the weapons and technology they make for the Asgardians, we must be prepared. The Dwarven King Thorgrim Grudgebear, who supports joining my Imperium, has been slowly declining jobs to build airships and weapons for the Asgardians, and is more focused on building my weapons and future space fleets. Finding the different ores for our weapons and armor for creations, the realm of Svartifheim is very rich in all the resources we need to fulfill my war effort, not to mention the skills and expertise the dwarves bring. But if they were to defect now, the Asgardians, including Odin, would immediately use it to start invading and occupying their lands. In that case, I would have to dispatch my Golden Legion and the few warships I do have to protect them, which would hinder my abilities and affect my long-term plans. Karara. Well, that explains why the dwarves have yet to join, considering I have heard Odin is a very controlling god in his realm. However, that really doesn't answer the question of why Hephaestus, the Greek god of technology and creation, has yet to join your Imperium officially. From what you said, he does work with humans in helping to develop new and advanced technology in multiple different aspects and fields, from warfare to space exploration, and more. He teaches humans how to work the new technology he helps them make, and shows how to produce it themselves, so why has he not defected from the Olympians to join your Imperium yet? Upon hearing Lady Carrara's question, the Emperor had a visibly annoyed and frustrated look on his face, which was very noticeable to both Isaka and Carrara, who had not expected that kind of expression from him. Emperor. Well, there's no reason to hide this, so I might as well explain it for you both. For one, the reason Hephaestus has not defected yet is a complicated matter. The first problem would be the pride of the king of the gods of Olympus, Zeus, who would not take it lightly for any god to defect from his control. If the Norse gods are prideful, the Greek gods are far worse when it comes to their hubris and arrogance. Along with the belief that they see themselves entitled to whatever they want no matter what it is, which especially applies to their king, Zeus. So, if Hephaestus were to officially announce his defection and join my Imperium, the Greek gods would immediately go to war to get him back and cause anyone that threatened their power to suffer. Though I could easily wipe them out, that is an unneeded disaster waiting to happen, because the Greek gods would go after the humans to lure me out. I will not risk innocent human lives, and Hephaestus understands this quite well. That's also why he has chosen not to do so, but to work in secret to help me. Isaka. Honestly, that makes sense. I have personally met Odin. He is perverted and corrupt with an unquenchable thirst for knowledge, not to mention being a very arrogant god. I have also heard that King Thorgrim Grudgebearer truly hates knowing that his people and his family for generations have been under the boot heels of Odin and his Asgardians. From what I've heard, he truly hates the gods, which would make sense why you two are very close with one another, my emperor. Not only have I heard that he is a fair and just ruler to his people, and even to the humans he interacts with, but he also enjoys teaching them new techniques for crafting weapons and teaching them how to create things. Karara. I must agree. I remember that day. We were invited to be a part of negotiations and to welcome an envoy from the Norse pantheon visiting the Shinto gods. I remember when they arrived, that perverted old man tried to look up both mine and Yasaka's skirts. What a disgusting old man. I was so happy when the Shinto pantheon did not agree to form any kind of trade or alliance with them due to his actions towards us. But, I will say I've heard stories of how prideful the Greek gods are, they will not even entertain an alliance or trade deals from other pantheons or factions they view as lesser than themselves. It is true that the Greek gods believe they are entitled to everything, especially their king Zeus, who is widely known as a grape god, considering all the women he has forcibly taken and impregnated. Not to mention, he's been known to be very vindictive and petty. I could definitely see him attacking innocent humans to draw you out if he found out Hephaestus was going to defect and join your Imperium. Isaka. That is very true. So, I can see why both you, my Emperor and Hephaestus are very cautious about the situation and how you act. You would rather not risk innocent human lives for his petty rampage, and Hephaestus would rather not defect from the Olympians yet until you are ready for him to do so, as not to put you in a position to act when you are not properly prepared to do so, even if you could easily deal with the king of the Olympians. But you said there was another reason, and I am assuming that is why you looked frustrated and annoyed when we brought this up. Could you please enlighten us on that if you would not mind, my emperor? Emperor. Sigh, I didn't think I would need to explain this. Have you two ever heard the story of the woman who brought Zeus to his knees, rained a thunderstorm upon the god of thunder himself, and rampaged through Olympus, almost killing every god there? Karara. Of course, I've heard the story. I don't think there's any supernatural being, regardless of faction or pantheon, that has not heard of this incident. It's something I've told my girls as a bedtime story when they were really young. It is said that Zeus tried to force himself on another human woman, not realizing that she was not an ordinary human woman. 
Being some sort of war goddess, it is said that in her rage of almost being graped by a dirty filthy god, she went to their mountain, laid siege to it, left it in ruins, and before she left, she gave a message for all the Olympians to hear. Though all the gods present, hear my words, if you dare come to find me or seek retaliation for what I did to your mountain or to your dirty old perverted Olympian king, know that I will return and kill every single one of you Olympians and turn your mountain into nothing but rubble. Bisaka. Yes, it was something that spread like wildfire through the entire supernatural world within a few hours after that event. Almost all the pantheons and factions on earth heard of what happened to the Greek pantheon and how the king of the gods was brought to his knees by a woman he tried to conquer. They said it took 200 years for them to rebuild Olympus back to what it was prior to that attack. I heard that the Greek gods are still looking for that woman for retaliation, and Zeus is hell-bent on conquering her, making her his personal concubine slave, due to the embarrassment and shame she brought upon his great name and the Olympians as a whole. It's even more embarrassing because the woman was obviously in tune with lightning magic and was able to wield such powerful lightning that Zeus himself was powerless to defend against it and was severely damaged. The emperor let out another annoyed and frustrated sigh before continuing, knowing that he's about to get bombarded with a lot of questions. Emperor. Yes, you can say she was very proficient at wielding lightning, but not the lightning you are used to. Also, she can be a war goddess, but not in the sense that you think. The story was exaggerated because she wasn't a war goddess from a different pantheon, it was a woman's wrath that Zeus ignited and his attempt to grape her. She was actually the strongest human woman to ever live and also happened to be a perpetual and the third strongest psyker, with only two stronger, which would be me and Malkader. She would also be the young boy you saw earlier, that is his mother, her name is Erda. Isaka. What that young and adorable young boy's mother is the Lady of Ruin. Emperor. Yes, and no, it's a complicated matter with the boy. And Lady of Ruin. Harara. Of course, it's the name the women of the supernatural world gave to the woman that made the most prideful and lustful god bow to her knees and laid ruin to Olympus. So we started calling her Lady of Ruin. The emperor let out a hearty laugh, breaking his normally stoic demeanor and showing a more light-hearted side to both Lady Karara and Lady Yasaka. Emperor. Ha 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 ha, Lady of Ruin, I knew about the incident, but I never knew the name she developed for herself since that incident. I look forward to informing her that she is known as the Lady of Ruin. And poor Issei not only has a protective mother. I feel bad if that boy makes her angry. Haha, <laughs> I'm sorry, my boy, I don't even think I could save you from her wrath haha. <laughs> Lady Yusaka and Lady Karara were a little surprised to see the very stoic and emotionless emperor break into hysterical laughter, which surprised them. But they were actually happy to see this side of him, showing them that the emperor not only had compassion, but could honestly laugh and enjoy himself. All the rumors of him just being a cruel, heartless, merciless man who wanted to purge all supernatural beings from the world weren't true, considering how he treated both of them this whole time and all he's already done for them. They knew at that moment they had made the right decision to side with the emperor and join his imperium. They were both smiling, finally realizing this, and more than that, they were honestly surprised. Not even the mighty emperor would dare try to get in the way of an enraged mother. It even caused them to chuckle a little bit, thinking of that thought. The emperor, finally calming down from his laughing fit, tried to recompose himself, however, the atmosphere was definitely a lot more light-hearted. This made Lady Karara a little more confident to ask the question that was on her mind. Karara. It is good to see this side of you, my emperor. However, I hope this question does not come off as rude by asking you this. But I never knew you actually had a child, nor did I have the impression that you were married or in a relationship with the Lady of Ruin. But aren't you afraid that if the supernatural world finds out that the Emperor of Mankind has a son, they might come to try to harm, kill, or kidnap him to use against you? After all, you are not the most liked, especially after your recent actions. Many native supernatural beings are panicking, such as werewolves, different mythical beasts, and more. They understand they might suffer the same fate as vampires and succubi because they have caused great harm to humanity in the past. If they were to find out you have a son, I would imagine that other factions or pantheons like devils, fallen angels, or the various gods from different pantheons would try to kidnap him for leverage against you, brainwash the boy, and turn him against you. Or even worse, they could just kill him to keep him from becoming a threat on the same level or even worse than you in their eyes. Are you not concerned about that, my emperor? Isaka. Karara is correct, my emperor. Especially if the gods of Olympus, particularly Zeus, find out this information and know that this boy is the Lady of Ruin's son. They will stop at nothing to capture him, to draw her out, and to get their revenge for the shame she brought upon their mountain and their reputation as a pantheon. I would hate to see anything happen to such a sweet and adorable boy like him who gives off such a warm presence. Honestly, it's very similar to what radiates from you, my emperor. Emperor. 
Well, the matter in regards to the boy is complicated, but yes, he is Erdas and my son. There's more to it due to his complicated circumstances, but I can explain that later. As for whether the Greek pantheon wishes to meet their end, by all means, they may try. If they think of Erda as the Lady of Ruin, an unstoppable natural disaster that caused unimaginable damage to their mountain, the gods, and even their king the last time she attacked Olympus and the king of the Olympians, what do you think she would do if they dare touch or come anywhere close to her child? I can promise you it would be the end of the Greek pantheon. But not to change subjects, there are more pressing things I would like to ask both of you, Lady Karara and Lady Asaka. Karara. What would that be, my emperor? Asaka. Yes, we would be more than happy to tell you anything you would like to know if it's something we are capable of or have knowledge of. Emperor. I would like to know what happened to the former East Yakai leader, Nekashu, Nerarian, and the Nekamata, Megari. Also, Yusaka, I would like to know what happened to your mother, Lady Yukiya. Upon hearing the Emperor's question, both Karara and Yusaka had a sad look on their faces. Instantly, that made the Emperor wonder what had happened, especially to Lady Yukiya, Daisuke's former mate. He did notice he hadn't heard from Yukiya the last time he tried to contact her to check up on her in the last 100 years. He knew something horrible had happened. Karara. My emperor, I would like to know, and please do not take this the wrong way, why you would want to know what happened to my mother and father. I would also like to know how you know about them and what kind of relationship you had with them. Isaka. Yes, I would also like to know how you knew my mother's name, considering she was only really well known by the other Kitsunes, because she was married to my father, who was the lord of the Kitsunes, my father Daisuke, before they were wiped out by the other factions, for reasons my mother never told me about before she died. So, if you know something, please, I would like to know, my emperor. The emperor sighed, understanding that his old friends, Lord Nerarian and his mate Lady Megari, along with Lady Yukiya, had died. They did not tell their children about the events that happened towards the end of the Great War or much about their relationship with him. They understood why they didn't, in order to protect them, so that other factions wouldn't find out about their relationship or know about their parents' connection or assistance to the Emperor. Knowing that they could be made to pay for their actions in assisting him, he understood that they did it to protect their daughters like any parent would. Because they just want to make sure their children are safe from harm and not affected by their actions. He solemnly understood why they made this decision. Now that they were both under his protection, it was time that they knew the truth of everything. Emperor. Lady Yusaka and Lady Karara, what I'm about to tell you is something your parents, for good reasons, did not tell you for your own safety. All I ask is that you do not hate my old friends, your parents, for what I'm about to tell you. We go back very far, and they have helped me and humanity in ways you couldn't have imagined. Honestly, I had the utmost respect for both Lords Daisuke and Nerarian, and I truly enjoyed the conversations I had with Ladies Megari and Yukiya. So, if you are ready to hear the story, I think it is about time their daughters knew of the great things they have done not only for me, but also for humanity, and the promise I made to your father, Lady Yasaka. Both Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara were taken aback by what the Emperor said. He knew both of their mothers and fathers, and the way he spoke of them sounded a fondness and joy. Understanding that their parents had held secrets from them, they wanted to know everything now. It looks like they would be told about everything they wanted to know from what their parents kept secret from them and their relationship with the emperor by none other than the emperor himself. They could have never imagined the emperor himself telling them this information about their own parents or the connection he had with them. They soon gathered their thoughts and both nodded to him as the emperor began to explain everything to them of the events that took place towards the end of the Great War and everything their parents had done for humanity. They both listened attentively to the emperor's words. Scene change. As the Emperor explained everything to Lady Yasaka and Karara, telling them the story of their parents and their relationships, another conversation was taking place in Lord Michael's office on the sixth level of heaven. Lady Gabriel had gone out to get Taji Shidu's wife, Iris Shidu. Currently, they are all sitting on two couches facing each other in Lord Michael's office. Both were stunned, shocked, and heartbroken after hearing the explanation Erda had told them about what happened to Issei. After Erda finished explaining everything to both Tauji and Iris Shidu, a somber and dense atmosphere of silence filled the room. Despite Mrs. Shidu's attempts to hold back her tears after hearing everything that the boy went through, as she had always thought of Issei as a son, considering how close he was with her daughter, she couldn't hold it back anymore and broke down crying. She immediately clung to her husband and cried into his shoulder as he held her tightly, trying to comfort his wife. Iri. Sobbed Tauji, both Mickey and Goro are gone. Killed by one of those crow bastards Saab poor Issei saw his parents mutilated by that crow, and that sadistic cruel heartless monster who killed them was going to do the same to him they didn't deserve that. Saab they were good people, a good family, and he was such a good boy to our little girl. Saab oh, Tauji how are we going to tell Irina this? 
She was so sad and depressed after we left Japan. It took us so long to get our little girl back to normal. I don't want to lose her again by telling her about her childhood friend and her little crush. It will break her little heart. Sob. Aoji, who was trying to fight back tears to stay strong for his wife in this moment, whispered, SHHH, I know they were good people, and that boy didn't deserve that. I understand how you feel. I saw my little girl so broken hearted, and I don't want to see her like that again. Issei was a kind hearted boy, he didn't need to see his parents in that state. He didn't deserve any of this. The couple embraced each other tightly, taking in all the tragic news of what happened to the Haidu family and Issei himself, to the point that not even Tauji, a very hardened man who has seen many atrocities and has become numb to many things over the years of being an exorcist and reaching the level he is now, began breaking down as he held his wife after hearing everything that happened to the family and the boy. The cries and sobs of the Shidas filled the room, causing both Gabriel and Michael to once again think of what their uncle had told them about what happened to the boy. Both saddened and disappointed that one of their former brothers could do that. And Erda, who could clearly understand how much these two cared for the boy and their family, considering how Mr. Shidu was willing to point a weapon at her, not knowing she was the third strongest psyker, and could have easily killed him if she wanted, even more so how he blatantly defied the orders of one of the seraphs. It showed her how much he truly cared for the family and the boy. Now, hearing his wife's cries of misery and sorrow after hearing everything that happened, truly solidified how much these kind and loving people cared for him and thought of him as their son, and how much they knew their daughter would be affected. Erda wanted to try to do something to give them some sort of comfort and break the somber and solemn silence that had consumed the atmosphere. That's when she spoke up. Erda, I truly see how much you cared for the Haidu family and their son. I see it through the emotions you display now and your heartfelt cries of sadness for what happened to them. But I would like to give you some comfort the boy is all right and he has finally woken up since the procedure to save his life was a success. As I mentioned before, I explained everything I can as of now, but know his memories of his old family and what happened on that day have been sealed away for the time being until he's old enough to comprehend what happened. We did leave the memories of your daughter. As for you too, I do not know if Neath left those memories intact or not, that is something I would have to ask him. Iri released her embrace of her husband and began trying to wipe away her tears so that she could speak. Iri, I understand the reasons why the Emperor chose to seal away the boy's memories so he does not go on a single-minded vengeful quest for revenge. I truly appreciate the fact that you and the Emperor saved his life and the procedure was a success. But why couldn't you just use healing magic or something else? Why did you have to replace the boy's DNA with that of yours and the Emperor? I understand not all of it was taken, but a majority of his DNA was replaced with the Emperor's and yours. Wasn't it bad enough that he lost his parents, and now he's lost almost any true connection he had with them, since this procedure was done to him. Or the side effects that could happen to him, I don't want to sound disrespectful and ungrateful for everything you and the Emperor have done, but as a woman who saw that boy as her own child, I want to know the reason why. Erda. I understand your frustration and anger and would like to tell you more, but I can't. It is not my decision nor my place to reveal that information. I wish I could give you some more peace of mind. All I can tell you is I had the same arguments with the Emperor as you brought up. I hope you do not take this the wrong way, but I do not regret performing the procedure on him, nor do I regret now having the knowledge that a lot of his DNA from his original parents have been replaced with mine and the Emperor's. I expect that his body will start changing as it takes on the characteristics of our DNA. What I will tell you is I truly want both of you to know that I genuinely want to treat this boy as my own son, though I know that I will never replace his real mother who brought him into this world, cherished him with love, and only wanted the best for him before that tragic night took them away from him. But I promise I will give him all the same and more and protect him so that something like that will never happen again. He will get stronger to protect the ones he loves, so he will never experience that kind of pain again. Doji compassed himself and spoke. I understand the necessity of withholding some information, and it appears that we should seek further details from the Emperor regarding the procedure and the fate of the boy. I am grateful for your efforts in saving him and preventing him from becoming consumed by vengeance. I would appreciate information on the handling of Mickey and Goru's remains, ensuring they received proper burial and honoring their wishes. Additionally, I inquire about their possessions and estate, as Issei may wish to retain items that hold sentimental value once his memories return. This is a matter of importance to me. Erda. Ah, fair question. Actually, the Emperor took care of that all himself personally. He even got hold of the Hyatus's will and made sure they were prepared respectfully and buried where they requested in the cow cemetery. He also obtained possession of their family home, fixed it up, kept all possessions within the home, including photos and any other sentimental items that Issei might want once he gets his memories back and is keeping it in pristine condition for him. 
Upon hearing that everyone in the room was surprised, the first to speak up after recompassing themselves from the shock of hearing that their uncle personally went out of his way to handle all that was Gabriel. Gabriel. Auntie, I didn't know Uncle Neath went out and did that personally. How did you find out about this? Berta. Well, surprisingly, he didn't tell anyone except Malkater, and eventually Malkater told me when I was going to persist, Neath, to give his parents a proper burial in the way they wanted. Apparently, Nia thought it would be best for him to do it personally. So, when I found out, I was honestly shocked. I believe the words of your father, Gabi, honestly reached him, asking him to do right by that boy, and I think it was also out of respect for his parents. So, when the day he gets his memories back, he will not only understand that we did it for the right reasons, but the emperor truly felt sorrow for what happened to his parents, to the point where he handled it personally. Now, do I know that's the reason why he did it? Possibly. He usually does things with his own motives in mind. I will say he has been surprising me of late. He's actually been trying to care for the boy and act, or at least trying to act, like a good father, so I won't be too hard on him, because it does seem like he's trying. Either way, all I can tell you is he surprised me with his actions, and he keeps surprising me with the ones he keeps making towards the boy, especially once I did find out how he showed respect to the boy's parents and gave them a proper burial they deserved. Michael. Well, I know that you don't usually agree with everything he does, auntie, but uncle has always been a very caring and kind individual, especially towards humanity like our father. So, even though he can be a little harsh and rigid sometimes, he still cares for humanity. I personally believe he intends to be a good father to the boy. Berta. I am not saying he is not trying to be a good father, Mikey, but I have known Nia for a very long time, and I do know he cares for humanity. However, I could have never seen or could see him as a father, due to his personality and his mindset of prioritizing his ambitions for humanity. So, it's something I have to see with my own eyes before I even consider believing it, but he has started to give me some faith that he might actually become a very good father to the boy. As the three were talking, Taji and Irie had just learned how this woman, who is so close to the emperor, told them everything that happened to Issei and his family, and is now practically his new mother. They heard how she was calling Lady Gabriel and Lord Michael Gobby and Mikey, mentioning that the two Seraphs call her to auntie and refer to the emperor as their uncle. They were confused. Before they could say anything to get more information about what was actually going on and being said, sirens began to sound off throughout all the levels of heaven, and soon the speakers began reading out a warning from the speaker system. Warning warning warning. Warp activity detected on earth. Signatures indicate a warp rift opening demonic in origin. Demonic incursion imminent. Incursion location identified. Kyoto, Japan. Alerting all Imperial facilities. Activating Heaven's defense system. Closing off all entryways into Heaven. Activating all defensive measures. Void shields activated. Preventing anyone from exiting or entering. Heaven is now officially on lockdown. Warning warning warning. Repeat. As the message began to repeat itself, Erda was terrified and scared, knowing exactly what it meant. A warp rift was opening right where the Emperor and her son Issei were. She was panicking. Erda. Oh no, Issei, I need to go to him right now before it's too late. Aji and Irie were startled by what Erda just said and wanted to know what she meant by getting to Issei before it's too late. Irie stood up and in a panic yelled, what do you mean by warp rift opening? What do you mean we have to get to Issei? What's about to happen? What's going on? Is he in danger? Aji, yes, I would also like to know. I've been around heaven, and I know we've been upgrading the defense system thanks to the Emperor's custodians, along with some dwarfs and some of the Emperor's scientists. I've never heard of this kind of new defense system. What does it mean that access in and out of heaven is restricted? What's going on, and are we truly unable to leave? Erda. Michael, could you please drop the void shields? I need to get to a say before they do. I'm begging you. Michael. I'm sorry, auntie, I do not have the ability to deactivate the void shields yet. The system was just put in, and it's still set to activate automatically upon detecting warp activity. We haven't had the time to finish the installation of the full security system and defenses that would allow us to modify the settings and control different defense mechanisms, such as the void shield and defense turrets, among other things, due to resources being devoted to making sure the East and West Yakai faction security systems and defenses were fully operational before anything else so I cannot do anything until either the Emperor himself arrives, the code has been sent from the Imperial Palace to deactivate our defenses and lower the void shields, or the warp rift is closed. So I'm sorry to say this, but there's nothing I can do. Gabriel. Brother, you don't mean. Michael. Yes, no one can leave or enter heaven. Erda. Michael, there has to be a way to deactivate the void shields. Please, Issei is in danger. We can't let them get their hands on him. Michael. 
I'm sorry, but there's nothing I can do. All we can hope for is that as long as the Emperor is with him, he's safe. Auji. Can somebody please tell me what is going on? What is the threat that is so terrifying that has you so panicked and is threatening Asse? Why are we unable to leave due to these new security measures, like this void shield you're talking about? Iri, please, can somebody tell us something? If Issei is in that much danger, we need to find a way to shut down these security systems to go save him. Michael. I'm sorry, but there is nothing we can do as I've said. Unless we get the shutdown code received from the Imperial Palace or the warp rifts are closed, we can only sit here and hope for the best. Unfortunately, the full installation of the security system has not been finished, and so we do not have the controls yet in heaven that operated. Erda. No no no. This can't be happening. Finally, I got a son, a child I can call my own, and I'm going to lose him to those damn gods this can't be happening. Erda let out a very painful and emotional cry and fell to her knees. She begged to be able to go to Issei to protect him. She began crying her eyes out. Seeing this, Gabriel immediately ran up to her and tried to comfort her, while Michael went up to both Tauji and Iri. They both looked at him, wanting answers. Michael. I was hoping we could explain this in a better situation, and not in this kind of scenario, but it looks like I have no choice. I will tell you everything I'm possibly able to. Whatever else I can't, hopefully the Emperor can fill you in later when the situation has calmed down, and things are hopefully resolved in a good way. Auji and Irie nod at what Michael had to say, wanting to finally understand what in the world was going on, and the true danger Issei was in, amidst everything else happening. Meanwhile, Gabriel tried to console her frantic and sobbing Aunt Erda. Scene change. Fifteen minutes earlier, back with Issei, Shirin, Kuroka, and Trej Anne finally arrived at an old-fashioned Japanese-style house in the middle of the forest. Issei. I think this is it. Kuroka. Yeah, I remember visiting this place when I was younger with my mother and Auntie Yasaka to meet the old grumpy monkey man. Shirin. Ice, you should knock on the door. Issei. Wait, why me? Trej Anne. Oh, what is this now? Come on, boy. What happened to all that bravado you had earlier, and everything you said and promised? Like how you're going to be there for these girls and protect them, no matter what. You have to be a man of your word after all, so time to step up and be the man I know you are and can be, haha. <laughs> Hiroka. Yeah, Ice, you did promise you would be there for us. Shirin. Ice promised to be there for us. Issei could only let out a sigh as he knew he was defeated and outnumbered. But right before he knocked on the door, Trajan immediately felt a strange presence around him, and he promptly told the children to get behind him. As he turned around and assumed a defensive stance, ready to take down anybody or anything that would try to threaten the children, especially Issei. That's when a hearty laugh was heard coming from above in the trees, and soon enough, something jumped out of the trees right in front of Trajan. The figure that was now in front of him was a monkey man smoking an old-fashioned pipe and wearing a red robe with a covering over his eyes while holding a red pole. This individual was none other than the legendary Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong. Oh my, well, I must say you have some keen battle senses, golden warrior. Dredge Ann, upon realizing who this was, immediately returns to a more neutral stance before greeting the new guest. This is quite an honor to get a compliment like that from the legendary martial artist Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong. Well, it's not every day that I get visitors, especially young ones. And if my eyes are not deceiving me, it seems like the daughters of Lady Karara have graced me with their presence. It is an honor, Princess Kuroka and Shirin. And it looks like the young ladies already have a suitor coming for their hand in marriage at such a young age. My boy, you must be quite the incredible man to capture these two young hearts haha, but moreover, it seems you have accompanying you one of the many formidable golden warriors roaming around Kyoto with the angels, upgrading our city into what it is now. It's quite an honor to meet such a revered warrior. I can sense your battle instincts are honed to perfection. So, what do I owe this unexpected but welcome visit by you and the rest of the group? Hiroka and Shirin began to blush madly, turning their faces bright red at what Sun Wukong said. They looked over at Issei shyly and felt a rush of feelings as their hearts raced when looking at him. They didn't quite understand these feelings they were having towards him all of a sudden, but they liked the way they felt when they looked at him. Issei, on the other hand, was also blushing and gave slight glances at the two girls, seeing how cute they looked with their blushes on their faces. Sun Wukong, haha. Well, it looks like the young boy over here might soon become a young lord, because, based on the way these girls are blushing madly at you and the way you're looking at them, I can see that there is definitely something building between you, boy, and the young princesses. So, I recommend not breaking their young hearts. I know their mother from experience, and she's a very overprotective lady. But I feel no ill intentions from you, and you seem to have something great within you just waiting to be unlocked, so I doubt you would do something of that nature. 
I look forward to seeing what future lies ahead of you with these young ladies and what you will achieve in life as you grow. Dredge Ann, upon listening to the kind and playful banter Sun Wukong was having with the children, teasing a say, which made him smile, and sensing no ill intent or hostility from Sun Wukong, dropped any reason to have hostilities or need to be on guard, and decided to have a more relaxed demeanor, as he put his guardian spear at a resting position, holding it straight up. Dredge Ann. I must agree with you there Sun Wukong. He seems to have already captured the hearts of these young ladies. I also appreciate the compliment coming from you. It holds value considering your martial prowess, Sun Wukong. But the reason we are here is because they were suggested to come visit you by Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara. Both Shirin and Kuroka were blushing even more upon hearing what Sun Wukong and Trejan were saying, making both young girls think about what their future might be like with Issei in their lives, possibly as something more than just friends. Issei, wanting to change the subject and also noticing how their faces were becoming more flushed than before, decided to bring up meeting one of the legendary Dragon Kings, Yulong. Say, Sun Wukong, Lady Yasaka also told us that you had one of the youngest dragon kings, Yulong, staying here with you. Is that true? Both girls, upon hearing Issei's question, were reminded that they also wanted to meet the youngest dragon king. They broke out of their thoughts, shook off their massive blushes, and looked toward Sun Wukong, hoping to hear that the dragon was nearby, so they could meet him. Sun Wukong. Ah, I appreciate my two ladies offering to have visitors come see me. I don't really get a lot of visitors other than the new recruits I have to train for the Royal Guard. But I hate to disappoint you, children, unfortunately, Yu Long isn't here currently. He likes to go off and do his own thing from time to time. He will eventually return, but I'm sorry to say, kiddos, I don't know where he is right now. Issei Kuroka Shirin. Aw. Oh. Sun Wukong. Sorry about that, kiddos. All the children had sad expressions on their faces, wanting to meet a dragon today. However, that was until Trejan spoke up with an idea to lift up all the children's mood, along with being able to test his skills against the legendary fighter before him. Trejan. It seems that the dragon that the children were so eager to meet today is not here currently. I do not think that should stop us from giving them a good and exciting show, not to mention seeing how my abilities stack up to a great and legendary fighter like you, Sun Wukong. I suggest we let the children watch us as we spar with one another. What do you think? Sun Wukong took a hit from his pipe before putting it down, exhaling smoke, and sporting a very eager and battle-hungry grin on his face before he spoke. Sun Wukong. Interesting. I would be lying if I said I'm not curious to see which one of us could win in such a spar. I've heard many great things about the martial prowess of the Emperor's most elite guards, not to mention being able to spar with the Vice Captain himself and one of the elite warriors of the Emperor. I would be very happy to give the children a show in that regard. But my question is, would you be opposed to me using my personal weapon in this bar, and what would be the rules, of course? Trejan. I have no objections to you using your own personal preferred weapon, just as I hope you do not mind if I use the weapons that were personally crafted for the Emperor's elite warriors, such as my guardian spear. It would be dishonorable to me and all my fellow custodian brothers, as well as an insult to the Emperor, who had these powerful and magnificent weapons personally crafted for us alone to use. As for the rules, I believe them to be pretty straightforward. No lethal blows. An opponent must concede defeat when on the brink of being fatally struck or disarmed and unable to carry on fighting. Would these rules be acceptable to you? Sun Wukong. Sun Wukong. Ah, wonderful I'm glad you feel the same way as I do about this. I have trained with my own personal weapon for so long and am so used to how I fight with it that using anything else to spar or fight with would feel unnatural and wrong. I see in a way that you and your fellow golden warriors have the same outlook, considering your armor and weapons all look like they have been personally crafted for the emperor's elite golden warriors to use, and no one else. I can agree to those terms, and they all seem fair. I will enjoy this, especially since I won't have to hold back in this bar, considering I'm fighting a warrior of your caliber. I've already seen how well enhanced and tuned your senses are, so I agree. We can go behind my home, where there is a large field that I also use for training some of the new recruits for the Royal Guards of Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara. Are you okay with fighting in an area where I have more knowledge and experience regarding the terrain and the layout of the land? Dredge Ann. As the Vice Captain of the Custodian Guard, selected by the Emperor as one of his elite warriors, I am prepared for any battle condition. Regardless of the terrain or environment, I will face any challenge with confidence. Rest assured of that, Sun Wukong. But what do you think about that, kids? It looks like you'll still be able to see a show. It may not be exactly what you came here to see, but I'm sure you'll all be amazed and impressed with what you will witness. Wouldn't you all agree? Issei, Kuroka, and Shirin's moods immediately brighten upon hearing that they will be able to witness a fight between Trejan and Sun Wukong, for themselves, even if it is just a spar. 
Groka. This sounds amazing I want to watch for sure. I may not be able to meet a dragon, but this definitely sounds a lot better because I want to see how one of the mighty golden warriors of the emperor faces off against the legendary Sun Wukong, someone both my auntie and mother hold in high regard for his skill and prowess. Shirin, with a very soft voice, said. I'm also excited and looking forward to seeing the fight between one of the giant golden men and the legend himself, Sun Wukong. She overheard her mother speak so highly of him, though she was hoping the golden man would win. Sun Wukong. It's so nice to hear the princesses and daughters of my dear friend Lady Karara speak so highly of me. Still, I am interested to know why both of you girls, especially the youngest of the princesses, are more in favor of seeing the golden warrior win our little spar. I'm not offended by your girl's choice, but I'm curious to know why. To be honest, it seems like these golden warriors left a great impression on you two girls. I'm more curious to know the reason for that. Though I believe I can get the answers I seek by asking you, boy. So, tell me, who do you think will win our little spar? Do you believe the legendary Sun Wukong will win, or will it be the Emperor's vice captain of his golden warriors? Upon hearing Sun Wukong ask for Issei's opinion, everyone looked towards him, eager to know what the young boy would say, until he eventually spoke up in a very confident manner. Issei. Well, I believe in my father's custodians. Although I have heard many stories about you, the great martial artist legend and monkey king Sun Wukong, and I know you are truly skilled, I still have to go with Trejan. My father has a lot of trust in him, as does Valder, along with the other custodians. I have no doubt he will come out victorious in this bar between you two. As for both Kuroka and Shirin, they believe in my father's custodians as well because they were saved by them. Thanks to my father sending them to rescue them along with their mother, they helped reunite them as a family. Upon hearing that, everyone was surprised by the pure confidence and faith Issei had in his father's chosen elite custodians. Issei began to think of what Shirin and Kuroka had told him while they were walking together. The story of the day his father's mighty golden warriors with their mother came to rescue them and their people. It made Issei proud and happy to hear, knowing how amazing his father's custodians are and how compassionate his father can be. Issei was brought out of his own thoughts when he heard spirited laughter coming from Trejan, upon hearing his words of confidence and faith in him and all the custodians his father had entrusted with his own life. Trejan then walked up to the boy, put his hand on his head, ruffled his hair, and spoke. Trejan. Well, boy, I am quite happy to hear that you have so much confidence not only in your father, but also in Valder, me, and all my fellow custodian brothers. I promise I will live up to your expectations to show you that your faith in me is well deserved. Sorry to say this, Sun Wukong, but I am a proud warrior of the Emperor and Trajan Valoris, his vice-captain of his custodians, and to prove to the boy the faith he has put in me and my fellow brothers was not misplaced. So, regardless if it was just a friendly spar or true combat, you will not best me on this day, and even though the Yakai and humanity are officially united under one banner of the Imperium of Man, I intend to show you, legendary warrior, the might and power of humanity's finest warriors. Sun Wukong took another hit from his pipe before exhaling smoke and had a smile on his face. Well I must say that the boy speaks with pure honesty and faith in you, along with the others that the Emperor entrusted as his elite guards. Not to mention he answered the exact question I was curious about regarding the two princesses' heavy impressions of you and the Emperor's other golden warriors. But now I'm even more excited and looking forward to testing your skills and abilities along with your strength to see which one of us is truly the better fighter. I am pleased to know that, regardless of the spar, humanity and the Yakai race are now under one banner of this mighty Imperium that your Emperor has formed with both Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara. But if you all would please follow me to the training field so we can begin this match. After that, Sun Wukong began leading them to the back of his house where the training field was. Upon seeing him heading that way, both Kuroka and Shirin grabbed one of Issei's arms and started pulling him, following Sun Wukong. Trejan chuckled at the sight once more and also began to follow them to the training field where their match will take place. Scene change. Back with the Emperor, Yusaka and Karara after the Emperor finished explaining everything and how we knew both of their parents. Emperor. So that is everything. I truly want you to understand that I had the greatest respect for both of your parents, Yusaka and Karara. And Yusaka, I want you to know that every day I regret that I couldn't save your father, because out of all the supernatural beings in this world, it was your father who showed me the kindness of the Yakai race and how they saw humanity differently than many other races. I can never truly make up for everything he did and for all the sacrifices of his comrades who laid down their lives for humanity. Karara and Yusaka were both left speechless upon hearing everything the Emperor had to say and finally knowing the truth and how close the bonds were between their parents and the Emperor of Mankind. Unknown to her, Yusaka was crying. 
After hearing everything the Emperor told them, Karara was processing the new information she had just learned regarding the relationship between her parents, Yasaka's parents, and the Emperor. Feeling a little overwhelmed, she wanted to see how her friend was handling this information as well. When she glanced over, she was surprised at what she saw. Her oldest and closest friend, someone she viewed as a sister, was crying. Karara then asked if she was okay. Yusaka heard her dear friend's concern for her and then noticed she was crying without even realizing it. She put one of her hands up to her eyes and felt the tears flowing. Now realizing she was crying in front of everybody, causing them all to worry about her, she started to wipe away her tears using the sleeve of her yukata. Afterwards, she stood up and spoke to the emperor in a very compassionate and thankful tone. Emperor. Lady Yusaka, are you alright? You're crying. Yusaka. Yes, I'm just fine, my. Emperor, but I'm truly thankful to you for finally giving me the much needed closure I needed. Emperor. What do you mean by that, Lady Yusaka? Yusaka. Because of you, my emperor, I have finally been given the final pieces I needed to understand everything now and to understand what my mother meant when she would always speak of encountering an individual with a soul that radiated such a brilliant golden light that would make even the very sun jealous. I now understand she was talking about you. She would also speak so fondly of you and my father, even though I don't remember much of him considering how young I was when he died. Emperor. Well, I'm glad I could finally give you the closure you needed and I always enjoyed spending time talking to Lady Yukiya. It was she and your father, Daisuke, who truly showed me that not all supernatural beings are evil and only look down on humanity. Yusaka, I know this might not mean much now, but I want you to know that your father was a great kitsune. He had a true sense of justice and would not hesitate to stand up for what was right. He had the full support and love of his people. I remember when he asked them if they would fight with him to help me save humans from this unjust slaughter that was happening. I remember how he said those who did not wish to fight could run and he would not blame them if they chose to do so. Even the women rallied to help. I saw none of them leave but instead stood by their lord and followed him. He truly won the hearts and minds of his people. Isaka was happy to hear how beloved her father was. Knowing how he was truly a great leader to his people and won the hearts and minds of many, including the emperor himself, made her happy and smile. She was about to speak when sirens began going off in her castle and throughout the city, grabbing everyone's attention. The emperor felt a disturbance happening within the warp, which gave him a bad feeling until the sirens started to blur out their message, confirming his fears. Warning warning warning. This message is being broadcasted to all imperial facilities and cities under the imperium of man's control. All citizens within the city, please get to the nearest emergency bunkers. All military forces, be on alert. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. Warp activity detected on Earth. Signatures indicate a warp rift opening demonic in origin. Demonic incursion imminent. Incursion location identified. Kyoto, Japan. All defensive military personnel are to be on alert. All city defenses are active and online. Void shields, weapons, and defense emplacements are now activated. All military personnel, please report to your designated commanders to be debriefed on procedures and receive further orders. Warning warning warning. Repeat. The message began to repeat itself through the loudspeaker warning sirens, that's when one of the stationed angels barged into the meeting room, causing the emperor to ask exactly where the incursion was occurring. Angel. My lord, I have the exact coordinates of the two warp rifts that are about to open in our area. One is directly outside the tree line of the forest behind Yasaka's castle, and the other one is opening deeper within the forest itself. Upon hearing the shocking news of an imminent attack on Kyoto by an unknown force, Lady Yasaka's horror was palpable. However, amidst the chaos, Lady Karara's panic was equally intense as she feared for her two daughters and the young boy's safety. As the emperor grappled with feelings of anger and foolishness for underestimating the chaos gods, the realization of Issei's significance in their plans dawned on him. The emperor's fury grew as he understood the grave threat posed by a particular chaos god who sought to lay claim on the boy, knowing the power he possessed. The emperor's visible transformation, with his eyes turning ethereal blue and crackling with sparks, filled the room with an oppressive aura, instilling fear in all present except his loyal custodians. Sensing the emperor's overwhelming rage, one of his custodians stepped forward to calm him down and focus on addressing the immediate threat, emphasizing the need to contain his power that was affecting the surroundings. The tense atmosphere underscored the urgency of the situation and the perilous stakes involved in protecting Issei from the malevolent forces converging upon them. Custodian. My emperor, I understand you are enraged at this situation, but we must handle this now, as you know. What are your orders for us, my emperor? Emperor. I want all of you to come with me, including both of you, Karara and Yasaka. The emperor directed his focus back towards his angel as he gave him orders. 
I want you to inform all the low and mid class angels in the city to continue helping all the citizens to get to the emergency bunkers and make sure all defenses are online. Also, inform the custodian commander in charge of the city's defenses to gather a force of 50 custodians, along with all the high class angels in the city, and inform them to meet me at Yasaka's castle. Is that understood? Angel? I understand, my lord. I will relay your orders. The angel then immediately ran out of the room to relay the emperor's message. That's when the emperor addressed Karara and Yasaka. Emperor. Lady Yasaka and Lady Karara, I know both of you have many questions, and I had planned to inform you about everything I know, including things that even the supernatural beings themselves are not aware of. But it seems like I will have to put that on hold for now. So, I need both of you to hold off from asking me any questions you might have until after the situation is dealt with, because our main concern should be repelling this incursion and ensuring the safety of the children. I promise once this is all done and over with I will tell you everything, especially things you need to know about your father, in particular, Lady Karara, but that must wait until this situation is dealt with. Lady Yusaka and Lady Karara looked at each other, both understanding as they exchanged a glance, then they both redirected their gaze back towards the Emperor and nodded at what he said, realizing they would find out more about everything that's going on later. But before that, they needed to deal with the situation at hand. Soon enough, they were all heading outside the room towards the meeting point the Emperor had instructed for all his forces to gather. They knew full well whatever force would be bold and brazen enough to attack somewhere the Emperor has pledged to protect and where he's currently at, at the same time, would be a force to be reckoned with, judging by how serious the Emperor became upon hearing about this warp rift and the kind of forces that would be coming out of it to attack them. It really showed both of them the seriousness of the situation, and they both understood that somehow that little boy played a big part in all of this. Emperor mentally. So the changer of ways is already trying to make his moves to obtain the boy. I should have expected this from him, considering out of all the chaos gods, you would be the first one to make a move to obtain the boy. I can promise you this, you will not have him, Sinch. Scene change. Back with Issei and the others, who were about to watch as both Sun Wukong and Trejan were in their respective battle stances, ready to start their spar. Suddenly, Issei began to feel an unimaginable pounding sensation in his head, making him scream out in pain, immediately drawing everyone's attention. Both Kuroka and Shirin were wondering what happened and were terrified that he was somehow hurt, while Trejan, in a flash of blinding speed, made his way toward Issei to check on the boy, with Sun Wukong not far behind. Kuroka. Ice are you alright? What happened? Are you hurt? Shirin. Please tell us what's wrong. What's causing you pain? Trejan had a very bad feeling about this until he heard Issei speak, which made him realize how truly nightmarish the situation was about to become. But soon after, the pain Issei was feeling started to go away a little bit, and the pounding sensation he felt in his head wasn't as bad and painful anymore, but still there. Issei then looked up at Trejan with a terrified look in his eye and looked very panicked as he started to speak in a frantic tone. Issei. We need to get out of here now please, they are coming. It's coming for me. Upon hearing what the boy said, Trejan immediately became even more serious and understood the severity of the situation better than anyone else right now. He looked toward Sun Wukong before speaking. Trejan. Sun Wukong, it looks like our fight will have to be postponed for the time being because we are about to face a serious attack. You need to get these two girls out of here and back to their mother at Yusaka's castle. They will be safer there. I will keep Issei with me, ensure his safety, and personally escort him to the Emperor. Sun Wukong couldn't help but recognize the gravity of the situation reflected in Trajan's serious expression. Having honed his combat skills through years of training and exploration, Sun Wukong knew the value of a fellow warrior's gaze and sensed the urgency in Trajan's request to take the two girls with him and leave the boy behind. Understanding that there must be a valid reason behind Trajan's decision, Sun Wukong trusted his instincts and chose not to question the instincts of a fellow warrior. Instead, he focused on the task at hand, prioritizing the safety of the girls and getting them out of harm's way before whatever danger lay ahead could hinder their safe exit from the area. With a shared understanding of the imminent threat, Sun Wukong and Trajan moved swiftly, united in their mission to protect those in their care. Sun Wukong. I understand. I will take both Princess Kuroka and Shirin with me and bring them back to Yasaka's castle. Kuroka. I won't go without ice. We can't leave him behind, especially if whatever is about to attack is targeting him. I won't abandon him. He has to come with us, or we'll stay with him here. Shirin. I agree with Big Sis. We're not abandoning you, especially since you promised to always be by our side and protect us. Sun Wukong was about to interject and take both the girls by force and immediately leave the area. 
that was until Issei walked up to both Kuroka and Shirin, extended both of his arms, and grabbed one hand of each of the girls, before he spoke in a very calm and caring voice. Issei. I'll be fine, you too. I have Trajan here to protect me. My father trusts him with his own life, and in turn trusts him to protect me. I have full faith he'll be able to ensure my safety. But I need both of you to please go with Sun Wukong now. It's important that both of you go with him because I don't want to see either of you hurt. I may not be strong enough to protect you now, and I know that. I plan to get stronger in the future so I can protect both of you and everyone else I care for. But as of now, I'm just not strong enough to protect you. If you are here with me, you could be hurt or worse, and that's something I don't even want to think about happening to either of you two girls. But I promise that you'll see me again and nothing bad will happen to me. After he finished saying that, he gave both the girls a heartwarming smile to reassure them that he'll be alright. Drejan. He's right, girls. He will be safe in my hands, not to mention you both have seen firsthand the strength and power displayed by my custodian brothers when they came to rescue you and your people. So have faith that I can do the same and protect him. Rest assured and go with Sun Wukong and know that we won't be too far behind you. Alright, you too. Hiroka and Shirin heard Issei's plea and saw his kind smile as he asked them to go with Sun Wukong for safety. Even though they were reluctant to leave him, his sincerity in wanting to protect them reassured them. They knew he cared for their well-being, so they agreed to go with Sun Wukong, trusting they would see Issei again at the castle. Still, it hurt them to leave him behind, and the youngest of the two sisters was still not convinced of wanting to leave him behind. Hiroka. Ice, I trust you. I know you're scared, and though I don't know what exactly has you so terrified, know that I care about you. So does my sister. You don't need to feel like you're facing this alone. You have your family, me, my mom, my aunt, and all of your father's custodians that will be here for you and stand by you no matter what. But just remember, you promised to come back to us, and I'm going to hold you to that promise, got it? Kuroka then hugged him tightly, tears in her eyes, as she broke off the hug and walked towards Sun Wukong to go with him. Shirin really didn't want to leave without him. She was determined that if he wasn't going to leave with her and her sister, she would stay here with him so he wouldn't have to face whatever was coming for him alone. She then wrapped herself around his waist as she held on to him tightly, screaming, No, I won't leave you, Ice. Let us stay by your side through this, because I don't want to leave your side. I just want, so let us stay by you. I don't want something bad to happen to you, please. Hiroka, seeing her sister's unwillingness to let go of Ice, knew what had to be done. She immediately grabbed her sister and managed to break her sister's tight embrace around Ice's waist and began dragging her towards Sun Wukong. Shirin was kicking and screaming, not wanting to leave his side. When Kuroka was by Sun Wukong again, he picked both sisters up immediately in his arms. Shirin was still fighting to break free from Sun Wukong because she really did not want to leave her new friend. She started to have weird feelings towards him that she didn't understand, they weren't bad, they just made her feel like butterflies were in her stomach when she was around him. More importantly, she just didn't want to leave him in case something bad was going to happen to him. But that's when Sun Wukong spoke up. Sun Wukong, holding both princesses, turned to Issei and spoke. I must say, you have impressed me, boy. The genuine care you display towards the princesses and concern for their safety more than your own is truly showing me the bravery and true kindness and compassion within your heart, adding on your selfless nature. You truly have impressed me for someone of your age. Full-grown men can't even have those kinds of characteristics, so you are truly worthy of my respect. I hope once everything settles down, I am able to see more of what you're capable of as you grow. I definitely want to be able to talk to you more, but I believe you are in good hands. But I must be off now. I'm sure these two little princesses' mother is worried sick about them. I look forward to seeing you again, boy, and that also extends to you, Golden Warrior. After Sun Wukong finished speaking, he immediately jumped high in the air and started leaping through the trees, heading back to Yasaka's castle. Kuroka was trying not to make it obvious she was crying, and Shirin was screaming for him, with tears streaming down her face. She was still trying in vain to break free from Sun Wukong's grasp, even after they were out of sight of Issei. After that, Issei began crying, knowing they couldn't see him breaking down, but realizing he had to try to be strong for them and keep his promise to them. He began to wipe away his tears. That's when Trejan put a hand on Issei's shoulder to reassure him before speaking. Trejan. Your bravery and dedication in protecting those you care for is truly admirable. I also understand that something had spoken to you in your mind and caused you pain and fear, but rest assured that I will support and protect you no matter what, so you have nothing to worry about or fear as long as I'm here. That goes for all the custodians, and I know your mother and father would feel the same way. We will protect you no matter what. You can rely on me to ensure your safety, even if it means sacrificing my own life to bring you back to the Emperor. 
your well-being is my priority, and I promise to stand by your side through any challenges that come up, that I promise you. That's when Trajan picked up Issei and cradled him protectively in his left arm, while holding his guardian spear in his right hand. That's when he saw the warp rift appear. He immediately lifted up his spear and aimed it towards the rift, prepared to slay whatever warp spawn or demon would come out of it. That was when the rift expanded, and a bird-like demon began to walk out of it amongst a horde of lesser demons accompanying it. Trajan, knowing all too well that this was a greater demon of Tsinch, one of his lords of change, then made eye contact with the greater demon, while the lord of change noticed that the anathema's warrior was holding the exact boy it came to collect for his lord. That's when the lord of change pointed his staff at Trajan and commanded him to hand over the child of the anathema. Surrender the child to me, for it is the will of the changer of ways who demands it. My lord wants that child for himself do as I've commanded, and you will be given a quick death, warrior of the anathema. Trajan, upon hearing what the demon said, did not hesitate or flinch. He made sure the boy was safely secured within his arms, as he immediately raised his guardian spear and hit a button on it. Soon, the blade of the spear was sheathed in a lethal haze of a disruptive energy field, as he pointed it towards the demon. He spoke in a determined and undeterred tone towards the greater demon and its horde of lesser demons accompanying it. Trajan. I will not surrender this boy to you. He is the son of the emperor who had entrusted me to protect his son. Furthermore, I am Trajan Valorus, vice-captain of the Emperor's Golden Legion, his hand-picked chosen warriors, his custodian guard. So, I will not bring shame upon my own name, my Emperor, or my fellow custodian brothers. I will not back down or give in to the demands of you demons or the gods that made you, because you shall not touch this boy. I will protect him with my life. So, if you wish to try to take him, I promise you I'll cut all of you down in the name of my Emperor. Trajan then whispered to Issei, don't worry, I won't let anything happen to you. I promise. Issei smiled at the reassurance he was given, he can't help but feel a little better, but his head still hurt, the whisper still ringing in his head. That's when Trajan returned his gaze back to the demon, his expression very serious and deathly. The Lord of Change let out a massive screech, calling forth a horde of lesser demons. The horde was composed of pink horrors, blue horrors, brimstone horrors, and screamers, charging at the warrior anathema and aiming to take the boy for their god. Quick description of the lesser demons. Pink horrors whirl and flail their arms, generating raw magic that fills the air. En masse, the pink horrors give rise to so much arcane force that they can hurl blasts of unnatural fire at the enemy. In combat the pink horrors use their powerful hands to choke, and, should they be slain, they split in twain to form two blue horrors. The blue horrors look the same as the pink horrors. Blue horrors are as resentful and bitter as their pink cousins are gleeful and capricious. Muttering glumly, blue horrors cast azure flames from their fingertips, stomping and protesting as they do so. Should a blue horror be slain, it groans and flashes into flame as a pair of brimstone horrors replaces it. Brimstone horror, named for a stench so strong it offends even other demons, these diminutive warp creatures may look bright and whimsical, but they are in truth spiteful and vindictive. They realize that the glories of authority and prominence are forever beyond them. Screamers streak across the skies with a wailing cry. They slash the foes they pass with razor-sharp horns and fins, before darting down to savage their chosen quarry with gnashing teeth. The bite of a screamer is fierce, their fang-filled maws able to gouge out huge chunks of flesh. End of description. The Lord of Change commanded his lesser demon hordes to kill the warrior of the anathema and bring him the boy alive or dead. Trajan, seeing the hordes of demons charging at him, prepared to charge right into the horde of demons while holding his say protectively. In his other hand, he wielded his powerful and mighty guardian spear, prepared and ready to slay the demons in front of him. He spoke in a very cold and ruthless tone, saying, it looks like you have chosen death, so in the name of the emperor of mankind, I will be your executioner. He then charged towards the horde and smashed right into the front line of the horde, starting to massacre the demons in dozens, with each swing of his guardian spear. He was truly showing the strength and might of humanity's most elite warriors, while massacring the hordes of demons, continuing to mow them down, displaying his blinding speed and power only a custodian of the emperor could display, while also protecting the boy, making sure he was not harmed in any way as he made his way through the horde of demons to bring him to the emperor. No matter what it took. Scene change. Back at Yusaka's castle, the angels and custodians were poised and prepared for battle for the impending warp rift to open, letting forth the gods of chaos, demon hordes to be unleashed. Following that, the emperor was briefing Lady Yusaka and Lady Karara. They were informed that they would remain near him during the demon incursion to protect them from any mind-influencing effects that could be caused by the demons or their gods. During the preparations, Sun Wukong emerged from the forest, landing before Lady Karara. He then released the princesses, Shirin and Kuroka, who were emotionally distraught. Lady Karara ran up to embrace her daughters upon seeing them, making sure they were safe and unharmed. 
Upon seeing their mother, Kuroka and Shirin ran up to her, crying and sobbing. They both shouted at the same time for their mother. Kuroka Shirin. Mother. Lady Karara immediately embraced her daughters and held them tightly. She had to calm them down, but before she could say anything, all she could hear was both of them crying and begging for her to save him. Kuroka. Sob mother, please, we have to save him. Sob he stayed behind and made sure we got out of there. Sob but I know he was scared. Shirin. Sob please, mother, he needs our help. Sob I could sense he was terrified of something. We need to go and help him before it's too late, please, mother, I don't want to lose I sob. It didn't take long for Lady Karara to realize who her daughters were talking about. Her eyes became wide, realizing that neither Trajan nor that young boy, Issei, were there, making her worry for his safety. After hearing what her girls were panicking about, she knew that he selflessly prioritized her daughter's safety over his own and made sure they could get back to her before anything else, as he stayed behind with Trajan. She began to tear up, thinking about how selfless, kind, and considerate that young boy was. She immediately looked at the emperor, stood up, and wanted to go save him, but as soon as Lady Karara stood up and went to speak to the emperor, she was frozen in place immediately upon seeing the terrifying yet concerned expression on his face. She was left speechless until she saw the emperor walking up to her children and kneeling on one knee to ask them something. Emperor. Young ladies, I would like to know something. Did anything happen to my son before you were brought here by Sun Wukong? Hiroka, who was the only one able to gather herself enough to talk while her sister was being comforted by their mother, Karara, because her sister was too much of a crying mess right now to say anything. Hiroka. Yes, sniff, all of a sudden he had a sharp pain hit him and started screaming in pain, holding on to his head. We were all scared and concerned. Soon enough, he was able to calm down a little bit and get up, but it looks like he was terrified, as if he had seen or heard something terrifying talking to him. Sniff. Hiroka, unable to contain her tears like her sister, began breaking down. She then begged the emperor to save him, feeling like he was in serious danger. That's when the emperor put a hand on her shoulder, reassuring her that they would save him no matter what, because as his father, he would make sure he would be brought back safe and sound, the same thing with Trajan. Before Kuroka could say anything in reply, his custodians got his attention as he looked over to see a warp rift opening right outside the void shields, which are protecting the whole city of Kyoto. Understanding what this meant, he asked him to get on the comms and communicate with the city's defensive tower, to have them open a small breach into the shields at their location, so they could immediately go searching for Issei, to save him before it was too late, and at the same time to fight off the demon incursion. He didn't lack faith in Trajan, but knew the tricks that the changer of ways would use to try to get to the boy, no matter what it took. He was soon snapped out of his thoughts as the breach was opened in the void shield, and at the same time, he felt the warp rift expand with a horde of blue horrors, pink horrors, brimstone horrors, and screamers began pouring out. The stationary turrets came to life and started firing on them. The custodians charged with their guardian spears and also fired rounds from them, attacking the demons and cutting them down. The angels also began to attack the demons. The emperor immediately told Sun Wukong to stay with Yusaka, Karara, and the girls within the void barrier. They all nodded in agreement to what he said, realizing arguing with him in this state, feeling the pure anger and rage that was coming off the emperor, would be a futile effort. Then when the emperor began walking over to where the breach in the void shield was made, his eyes glowing that ethereal blue with sparks coming from them, as he decided to join his custodians in the fight to push back this incursion and save his son. That's when the demons could sense the anathema's anger. They looked over to see his towering figure wielding his signature flaming sword, the demons that were directly in his sight immediately burst into ethereal flames due to the emperor's sheer power and presence as he walked through the hordes of demons like it was nothing, not a single one getting close enough to attack him as they were all burning and being completely and utterly destroyed. He then continued to walk into the forest to save his son while his angels and custodians were fighting the incursion, preventing it from spreading any further. Scene change. Trajan has been fighting off the demon hordes for 30 minutes, without making any progress due to the continuous pouring out of demons from the warp rift. He kept mowing them down relentlessly. The Lord of Change, seeing this, knew that his lord would soon become impatient, so he decided to act. Using his powers of the warp, he commanded the horde to swarm Trajan, making things more difficult for him, since he could only wield his guardian spear and the only arm he had free that wasn't holding a say. The Lord of Change also used his powers to restrain Trajan. Unable to move, Trajan scowled as the demons started to swarm and pile on him. This allowed the Lord of Change to lift the boy from Trajan's grasp before he was completely swarmed by the lesser demon horde. Now, with the boy floating in front of him, the Lord of Change began to speak. Lord of Change. Ah, so you are the child of the anathema whom my lord seeks to have for himself. You should feel very blessed, child, to have the gaze of my god upon you. 
He intends to have you ascend into demonhood, making you one of his demon princes. It is quite the honor to receive such special treatment from him and to receive some of his power so you could serve him and fulfill his will and desires. Issei, who is struggling to break free from this monster's grasp, speaks in defiance, not wanting to be a part of whatever this god wants him to be, declaring he won't serve anything like this god of his because he wants to be around his father, mother, all the custodians, and everyone he cares about, refusing to become whatever this thing wants him to be. The Lord of Change let out an evil maniacal laugh before speaking. You do not understand. You do not have a choice, and now I will make you watch as the Anathema's warrior is torn apart by the demon horde and killed in a slow and painful manner. The Lord of Change made the boy turn to see Trajan under attack by demons. Unable to move as they began to rip off his armor to tear his body apart, Issei cried out for Trajan not to give up. But the evil cackling and voice in his head intensified, causing his head to pound again and making him feel intense pain as he screamed out, wanting the pain to stop. The demon then spoke to the boy once more, forcing him to face it again. Trejan tried calling out to the boy, telling him to stay strong, not to give in to the words and whispers of the demon, and to have faith that his father would come to save him. Soon, he was muffled as more of the lesser demon piled onto him. Lord of Change. Haha, <laughs> there's nothing you can do, and you will be made to serve our god who will soon be yours as well. You will soon have a new master and be a slave to his will forever, giving him what he's always wanted never-ending enjoyment and satisfaction of the great game that will never come to an end. Ha 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 ha. Issei was beginning to cry. The pain in his head was continually getting worse, and he could hear the corrupted whispers getting louder within his mind. Unknown to Issei, it was the changer of ways himself, Sinch, trying to break his will and influence Issei to fall to his corruption and fully embrace him as his new god and master. Issei was starting to feel hopeless and was starting to break down, not wanting this to be what he would become, to turn against his own father, mother, Kuroka, Shirin, and Arena. He didn't want to turn against the ones he loves and become a slave with no will of his own. But soon, the evil ancient cackles, laughter, and whispers that were hurting him in his head were silenced, as if forced out of his mind, along with the pain it was causing him to stop immediately. Soon, a deep voice could be heard that he felt radiated power with each word it said. And that's when it began to speak to Issei. Mentally, boy, why are you crying? Are you not the son of the emperor? Are you also not the boy who made a promise to those girls? Are you not somebody who would stand up for those who need to be protected, be their shield, be the hero when it's needed most? Are you not the one who will stand up to tyranny, to the monsters that decide to come out of the shadows? Are you not the same boy who said, when a man gives his word, he will uphold it, no matter what? Were all those false promises you said to those two girls from a child? What about the man in front of you who has fought like an unmatched force of nature to protect you, or what about your father and mother who care for you? Would you break their hearts in such a way? What about that girl to whom you made a promise to become a better man, a man she would be proud of? Were all those false words spoken by a mere naive child who truly did not know any better or the true meaning of those words? They say mentally, no, I meant what I said. I will protect everyone I hold dear. I want to keep my promises and I want to become the man I promised Arena and fulfill the promises I made to Kuroka and Shirin. I want to become a man she would be proud of when we see each other again. I'm just not strong enough. Mentally, boy, you have no idea how strong you truly are, the power that you have within you, and I can help you unlock that power. Along with my power, you could truly become a force of unmatched power and good in this world, changing everything in ways you couldn't have imagined. So, I ask you, boy are you willing to be the man you promised to be, the hero that you've always wanted to be? Well, are you? They say mentally, yes, I do want to be the hero. I want to protect everybody I care for, never letting anyone I love or care about be harmed. Mentally excellent boy, you truly have a fire within you that could make any dragon's flame seem like nothing more than a small candle. I can feel the fire within you building up, ready to come out. Use my power and let it flow through you to unlock your own potential and show the monster in front of you the strength of the Welsh dragon and your own might and power. After the voice's declaration, Issei felt a power inside him build up and erupt like a volcano. Soon, upon feeling the massive power and change within the boy, the Lord of Change could feel unimaginable power radiating from him. It started to fill him with dread until he heard a deep and powerful voice echoing from the boy as a shining green light and a red gauntlet appeared on his left hand. It shouted in a deep and powerful ancient voice. Greg. Welsh Dragon Balance Breaker. Soon after the voice echoed throughout the whole forest, a surge of power exploded from where the boy was being held in the air by the Lord of Change, sending him backwards. He could now see in front of him the boy, who was engulfed in armor that resembled crimson red dragon scales with green orbs on the chest and back of the gauntlets, with giant dragon wings protruding from the back of the armor. 
What could only be described as menacing green eyes shone from the helmet and gave the demon a death glare. Then the boy's eyes began to shine, and so did the gems on the armor, which began to turn into an ethereal blue with sparks coming from them. As he lifted both of his hands in the air, radiating with power, he immediately sent the energy that was building up, extending his arms downwards, sending a massive wave of pure and unbridled warp energy throughout the whole forest, reaching beyond the forest itself. This act immediately killed all the demons in the forest that were coming from that warp rift and all those near Yasaka's castle, killing all the demons there as well, not banishing but permanently erasing all the lesser demons, closing all the warp rifts and severely damaging the Lord of Change, but despite that display of raw and unmatched power from the boy, a voice could again be heard. The same one he heard earlier. Greg. Well, I'm truly impressed, child. I've never had a host so young who upon awakening me, you immediately gained my power and did something that none of my previous hosts have ever done by achieving Balance Breaker. It seems like drawing upon my power allowed you to break the dams that were holding back your potential and power. But it looks like you are not fully ready to handle all the potential power you can wield yet. Do not be discouraged. You did well, boy. I see great potential in you and look forward to when we talk again soon, to seeing what you can accomplish and what awaits us, my new host. After hearing that, the balance breaker immediately began to dematerialize, revealing Issei once again. He was completely drained of all his strength after performing that massive show of power. He soon began to lose consciousness and began to fall over. However, he was soon caught by Trajan. No longer being held down and restrained, he was a little beaten up, but more than able to continue to fight. Before Issei fully fell into unconsciousness, he looked up and asked Trajan something. Issei. Trajan, did I do it? Did I protect everybody? Trajan. Yes, you did. I'm very proud of you, Issei, and I'm sure if your father and mother had seen the power you displayed right now and the reason you used it, I'm sure they would both be very proud of you as well. But you did very well. So, you can get some rest now, you've earned it. And just know that I and everyone else can take it from here. Issei, after hearing that, had a smile on his face. He then eventually fell unconscious in Trajan's arms. Trajan, not forgetting the danger, knowing there is still one demon left, knew it wasn't destroyed by the boy's attack like the others, but was critically damaged, which impressed Trajan. This caused him to have a small smile on his face, knowing how much damage this boy caused to a greater demon. Trajan then got back up on his feet and, with his guardian spear in his other hand, prepared for anything the demon was going to do. As the demon began to rise back up on its feet weakly but enraged, it started charging up an attack aimed at both the unconscious Issei and the injured Trajan. Lord of Change. I will not be made a fool of. I am the greater demon of Tsinch. If I am unable to take that boy back alive, I will kill him for my lord to forcibly make him into a demon prince to serve him. As the demon poised to strike at the unconscious Issei and the wounded Trajan, but right when the demon was about to fire his attack at the two, it was immediately and abruptly cancelled out. That's when overwhelmed by an intense surge of wrath and fury directed towards it, the demon found itself incapacitated and eventually hurled through the air, crashing into a cluster of trees before coming to a halt. When the demon managed to rise and face its assailant, a sense of dread overcame it as it beheld the approach of the enigmatic figure known as the Anathema. Shrouded in mystery, the visage of the Anathema remained obscured, yet the Lord of Change could discern an aura of insurmountable animosity, seething rage, and a palpable threat emanating from the entity's gaze, complemented by the menacing presence of a blazing sword, wielded with lethal intent. Emperor, you foolish demon, you dared set foot on my holy Terra and then tried to kill or kidnap my son, did you think I would let that happen? Did you think your transgressions would go unnoticed? With each step the Emperor took, the weight of his power armor and his anger shook the surroundings. Did you think you would be spared from my rage? As the flames from the sword intensified from orange-yellow to intense black-red with each step towards the greater demon, soon the Emperor stood right over the down and terrified Lord of Change, which could only understand the pure terror that it put inside other lesser beings throughout its existence, which was unbridled fear and dread now demon. You know exactly what is about to happen to you, and I will ensure that the psychic backlash will be felt by your master when I completely erase you. The Lord of Change, a formidable demon of the warp, faced an unprecedented sense of dread as it realized its impending demise. This realization came as a shock, considering its long existence and numerous conquests. The defeat at the hands of a mortal boy who vanquished its lesser demon hordes and caused immense damage to itself with unexpected prowess marked a turning point for the demon. It knew that this time, there would be no reforming within the warp, no rebirth from the ashes of defeat. The power of the anathema was too great for it to escape this final fate. The Lord of Change understood the futility of bargaining for its life with the Anathema. It acknowledged that its time had come, that the inevitable end was upon it. 
Despite its cunning and manipulative nature, the demon was resigned to its ultimate and irrevocable demise. Emperor. I will take great pleasure in eliminating you in an instant. The emperor then stabbed his sword into the demon, immediately causing it to be engulfed in black and red fire. Soon, the emperor charged his power and sent it through his sword, as the pulse of power traveled through the demon's disintegrating body and to its connection with its dark god, sending a shockwave through it that caused a psychic backlash, affecting the change of ways itself. Due to how much power the emperor used and put into his attack to kill a portion of himself that he used to create that demon. Though only a small fraction of what he was, Sinch could still feel an utterly painful backlash from the emperor's might. The emperor finished dealing with Sinch's Lord of Change and detected powerful new entities, appearing where Trajan and Asay were. The sudden arrival made him realize he had a lot of explaining to do to the newcomers. He knew Erda wouldn't let him off easily for this unexpected situation. Heading back to Trajan and Asay, the emperor prepared for a barrage of questions and explanations. He anticipated having to address the interrupted meeting with Lady Asaka and Lady Karara before starting anew with the unfamiliar faces. With a heavy sigh, the Emperor readied himself to clarify the recent events and what lay ahead. The weight of responsibility bore down on him, but he squared his shoulders and headed back to face the impending flood of questions. Ready to provide answers and guidance, he knew it was his duty to ensure everyone understood the events that had unfolded and the path forward. Scene change. Unknown location. Deep within the ruins of the former castle of Camelot, within the ruined castle's underground catacombs, in a secret and sealed off room, there is a massive steel door with seven sword-like key slots that appear to open this massive door. What lies within the sealed off room is a mystical sword locked in stone, pulsing and glowing well stuck in the stone, signifying that it has finally chosen its next wielder, who would be given the title of humanity's champion. That's when a female voice could be heard speaking. Well, it seems that you have finally chosen who you consider worthy enough to wield you once again. It has been a few centuries since your last wielder died, and it appears that you have chosen a new one. This can only mean one thing. Humanity will soon be pushed to the edge, where darkness is on the brink of consuming it all. Only through their prayers, hopes, and dreams, will they summon not only the sword, whose radiant light will slash through the darkness, but also the one who shall wield it the chosen hero and champion of humanity who is said to be the bane of the gods, and will finally put an end to them and their game using the very sword that holds the collective hopes and willpower of humanity within its indestructible blade. It seems that the prophecy is coming true, and soon the mantle of humanity's champion will be passed on to another worthy wielder of you. I look forward to seeing who you have chosen to wield you, Excalibur. Scene end. Additional information. In the Warhammer 40k universe, warp demons come in various classes based on their power levels and connection to their respective chaos god. The lesser warp demons, constituting a small percentage, can be categorized as greater, demon prince, high, mid, or lesser demon fragments. Comparing them to the hierarchy in DxD, a high-class devil would be on par with mid to high-class lesser warp demons. The true distinction emerges with the ultimate class and super devils in DxD, which are equivalent to mid to high-class mid warp demons. Contrasting the power dynamics, DxD universe's gods pale in comparison to the chaos gods in Warhammer 40k. In terms of recent accomplishments by Issei in the story, it is safe to assume that he pretty much eradicated what would be, in terms of DxD demons or devils, a whole heart of mid to high class devils, as a 7 year old who just unlocked the balance breaker and tapped into his hidden potential power as a psyker. Also, in Warhammer 40k, those who pray to certain gods and win their favor enough to be ascended by said chaos gods become demon princes, which are slightly weaker than greater demon counterparts, but can vary based on the power levels post-ascension could vary, with some beings matching or surpassing their greater demon counterparts, contingent on individual circumstances. Let me know in the comments below if you guys want the next part. Also check out my other video that has been shown and left. Thank you for watching, if you enjoyed this video please like and share this video. And have a fantastic day bye.